Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good to be on a meeting. Um, we're very lucky. I'm very lucky. We're all very lucky. Um, very few people actually get to AA, and um, even fewer stay here. So I definitely feel very appreciative that I'm sober today. Um, I haven't obsessed around drinking today. And um, I'm hugely grateful that I can come on to a meeting um, and share my experience, strength and hope with people. Um, Welcome to all the newcomers, people that are counting days. Um, If I'd have got this program when I first come to my first AA meeting, I'd be I'd be sober about fifteen years, but that wasn't to be. That wasn't my journey. It wasn't my story. Um, when I come out of my first treatment centre, thinking I'd hit bottom and um, I couldn't cope. Um, if I'd have got it second time round, when I come out of my second treatment centre. Having done all those things I sworn I would never do again. Um, I'd most probably be about seven years sober, maybe eight years. But I'm not. I'm just over five years. So the message in that is no matter how you're feeling today, no matter where you are in your journey, um, Whilst you've still got a beating heart, you still have the opportunity to get this program. I likened it to a um, a very small window of opportunity God gave me. Um, I either jumped through it and grabbed it with both hands or the um, the other alternative, as it says in our literature, was to carry on as best I can um, looking at jails, institutions, or death. And when I look back at my my last drink, um, gone were the days of swanky nightclubs and good-looking women sat on my table and money in the bank account and you know when when alcohol was working for me um, and it made me feel a part of not apart from um it didn't end up like that ended up with me in my flat on my own barely hanging on to a job Uh, financially broke, um, mentally destroyed. Um, There's a great description of that feeling in the book. Um, It's called incomprehensible demoralization. That's pretty much where I was. Quicksand stretching all around me, like a man falling down the mountain trying to hold on to the the trees as I fall, but just not being able to. The only comforting feeling I ever had towards the end of my drinking and on that last drink was that if only I just had the bottle to hang myself, then all this pain would go away. And that's sad, but that's the truth. The only comforting thing I found in life at the back end of my drinking was the fact that if I could just 
knock it all on the head. I wouldn't have to put myself through this and put people I love through this. You know, and I, I don't, <clears throat> I don't think about that, <clears throat> that last drink too much, but I keep it close to my heart because I actually believe it was some kind of spiritual experience for me. Um, I actually think in that moment, I had that, that clarity, that moment of clarity where what I was doing was no longer working for me anymore. Um, and it kind of, kind of surrendered to that. And I believe the higher power of my understanding, who I choose to call it God, said to me, right, Matt, you need to get back into the rooms and you need to go to AA again and give it another go. And um, that's the small window of opportunity that I'm talking about. It's funny, I've been around a little bit of time and I'm still a newcomer. Everything you hear tonight is regurgitated. No one's special, I'm just a guy trying to stay sober trying to stay clean, trying to be the best human being I possibly can be. But it's important for me to hear things that I identify with and I can take with me on this journey. Every AA story kind of starts the same. Well, not for some people. I was really uh, resentful of those people. You know, the ones that come into their first meeting you know, two cars on the driveway, job, wife, husband, had that amazing spiritual experience in the first 20 minutes of their first meeting and never drank again. That wasn't my story. And I'm not resentful of those people anymore. Um, I'm absolutely glad of every single relapse I ever had. Now, if you'd have asked me that two days sober, I wouldn't have said that. But I needed that. It's part of my story. It's a part of my journey to get me to that point, which it talks about on page 30 of the big book, which for me is where the whole basis of my recovery starts. And it says, we learned that we had to concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholic. The delusion that we are like others, or presently maybe, has to be smashed. Now, it's the presently maybe bit that keeps my interest, because here I am, five years, a few months over, great life today. Great life, father, um, getting married, no financial worries. Can look at myself in the mirror. Don't hate that person that I look at. Um, but I can't fall into the delusion that when my partner sits out on our terrace in Germany, it's just where I live now, and she's having a nice glass of Pinot Noir looking at the sun coming down and the moon going up. I can't ever fall into that delusion that maybe I'll just be all right this time. Maybe I'll just be all right. My experience tells me that if I stop, I don't work the steps today. Don't work them. I've already taken the steps. I've taken the steps and I apply the 12 principles. If I had to really say the steps that I, that I really apply on a daily basis, it would be steps 10, 11, and 12, which are basically steps what, two to nine anyway. But I can't ever fall into that, that delusion. So how do I keep myself healthy? Because if I stop going to meetings, if I didn't have a home group, if I wasn't trying to apply the 12 principles in my daily life, 
if I wasn't carrying this message that was so freely given to me, to other still suffering alcoholics, if I wasn't in service in AA meetings, if I wasn't in service in my community, my experience tells me there will be a time I will resort back to self and I will be powerless over that first thought of picking up because that's been my experience. So I have to stay in the middle of the boat, the middle of the triangle, have to, on a daily basis. And I have to continue to try and enlarge my spiritual life on a daily basis. So, one thing getting here, another thing staying here, another thing staying here. So, that, that saying that I spoke about on page 30 of the big book, I read that page loads of times um, until it was pointed out to me. You know, we learned. We learned we had to concede to our innermost selves. So my learning was my relapsing. My learning took me to the point of incomprehensible demoralization, quicksand stretching out all around me. Grateful I got to that point alive. Grateful. The delusion that I am like others, I'm not like my partner who's really capable of having a glass of red wine every night and sometimes leaving off most of the time, actually. Not like that person. Why is that so important? Why is that so important for me that that comes from my heart? Because for me, it's not about outside circumstances or conditions, or results of my life. It's an inside job. It's not an outside circumstance. Why I say that is because if I'm getting sober on consequences, don't get me wrong, I have a lot of consequences. You come back into, come into the rooms, you start getting well, Stop doing what you're told. Life gets better. Life gets better. So that's why <clears throat> the conceding part of my innermost self, the delusion that I am like others or present baby, has to be smashed. Inside job, not external circumstance. The consequences at the tail end of my drinking are the are, are are the results of hitting bottom. It's not hitting bottom. It's not my rock bottom. I lost jobs. I lost relationships. Lost money. They're the results and consequences. All of that stuff. The rock bottom I'm talking about, that I experienced, was that spiritual rock bottom. That internal snap. Because as those outside circumstances straighten out, we get the job back, we get the woman back, we get the money back. We falsely believe, or I falsely believe, that I'm sitting pretty. And I'll say to myself, oh, maybe you weren't that bad. Man. Maybe now, after this amount of time, maybe you could. Maybe you could. No debate in society in my head today. No debating society. So that's something that I thought was was quite important um, to share. Um, and I always thought, I always knew I was powerless over alcohol. But I kind of missed the point of what powerlessness was, really. I always believed powerless was solely what happens to me when I put a drink inside of me. You know, the allergy. You know, all bets are off type thing. And that's what I 
originally accompanied powerlessness with that was my that was my thought process until someone explained to me if you're talking about powerlessness as a sense of what happens when you take one you miss the whole point of what powerlessness means it caught my interest so I wanted that person to explain to me I wanted to try and identify with it in my experience. So powerlessness for me isn't just what happens after the physical allergy kicks in. It's what I say to myself. How many times have you said to yourself, how many times have I said to myself, I ain't going to do this again. I'm done. Done. On Tuesday, you feel the same. On Wednesday, kind of still feel the same on Thursday you start to feel physically better you start to think oh maybe it wasn't as bad as what I thought it was and then you repeat the same disruptive behaviour over and over again but not wanting to now that's the that's the key bit there, not wanting to, not wanting to. I'm going against my will, my thinking. I don't want to do this again, but I'm doing it, doing it. But I don't want to be doing it. You know, for me, that's what powerlessness is going against every moral compass in every bone in my body, not wanting to do it, but doing it. And then doing it again and again, the hamster on the wheel, the hamster on the wheel. Yeah, and I look back at that, it's very grateful, very grateful to that. I really do. And it's, it's funny when I look at, and I, and I talk about the step before the step, the conceding part on page one and, 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 and step one. Because for me, they're, they're so fundamental. Because it's what the whole of my recovery is built on. So unless I've conceded to myself, unless I understand what powerlessness is, unless I understand what unmanageability is in the first step, if I ain't got those grounded in, I'm building it on rocky ground because that's been my experience. And what happens when you build something on poor foundations? At some point, the whole building falls down. It's the same principle. It's the same principle. So when I was telling my sponsor at the time how unmanageable my life was, you know, this has left me 40 grand in debt again, been bankrupt five years before that. Um, barely hanging on to a job, you know, all the crap that's, that has, were results and consequences of my drinking. You know, that isn't the unmanageability that the book's talking about. My life is unmanageable, yes, because I drank. But my life was unmanageable before I drank. Before I even touched a drop of alcohol. So when I look back at my childhood, and um, I think about how I was and how I felt as a child, I can kind of just remember... Never feeling a part of, always feeling apart from. Never quite knew what group of friends I wanted to knock around with. So I would use different masks and fit in with the group that would best suit that mask. So I had this, this feeling of 
irritability and restlessness and discontentment from a very, very young age. When I share that stuff with, yeah, you know, I don't share that with a normal person, but generally if I've shared it with someone, my brother or my mum or my partner, they kind of look at me with this weird look. They just don't get that. They don't understand that, that feeling. Just can't identify with it. So the unmanageability was there way before. It was an emotional unmanageability. It was the reality. Not being able to manage reality. Not being able to manage my emotional feelings. Not being able to manage certain life situations that other people deal with with ease. I wasn't able to do that. So I felt different from the off. And, you know, this bit is a spiritual malady. However, I'm keen to say here, spiritual malady isn't the reason why I'm an alcoholic. That's not the reason why. You know, if you look at every single person in this world, I would say everyone is spiritually sick to different degrees. But it doesn't make certain people who are spiritually sick alcoholics. Why? Because they don't suffer with a physical allergy in the middle of session. When they take one, all bets are off. They don't know when they're going to stop. And when they're not drinking or thinking about it. You know, there's only two questions in the big book that qualify whether you're an alcoholic. I was going through all these 30 question things, spending 30 grand in rehabs and all this stuff. Actually, all I needed was to answer two questions in the big book that qualifies me, whether I'm an alcoholic or not. Two questions, two questions only. When you take one, do you have little or no control over the amount you take? Question one. Yeah, I don't find that. And when you stop, do you struggle to stay stopped? Yeah. Stopping is not my problem. I can stop for a bit. I can get away from those people and the bad people, the bad influence on me, all that. That job, because that's the reason why I'm drinking. It's that job. Not happy in that job. Nah, I need a new job. Actually, London is the problem. If I just didn't live in London with all these amazing bars and nightclubs and good-looking women, that's the problem. So I'm going to move from London. I'm going to move somewhere else. I've done all that. I moved from London to Milton Keynes, for Christ's sake. Sorry if anyone's ever lives in Milton Keynes. It's a very nice place, but just trying to make my point. And... Um, It was none of those situations. It was that constant feeling of irritable, restless, and full of discontentment. And I suffered with the physical allergy and the mental obsession. Twofold illness, not three. Physical allergy, mental obsession, coupled with a spiritual malady. So... Back in my teens, when um, I was fully aware that something not quite right for me, drinking was a, a solution to how I felt, because it worked for me. Worked really well, maybe for the part of, not apart from. Worked really well. Problem is, if you're an alcoholic of the sort described in the book, it's progressive. The illness is progressive. So at the start, it's quite fun. In the middle of it, drinking with consequences. At the end of it, all right, all right, just consequences. Nothing fun about it. Just horrendous consequences. And that, and that coupled with that internal spiritual snap, that conceding to yourself is the basis for me that started me off on this journey for hopefully the last time. It's been a it's been a great great journey. It's um 
I'm a really comfortable guy in my skin today. Um, it's funny when I think about, I share it with people I work with and, you know, my higher power and a God of my understanding has changed through the five and a bit years that I've been in. My, my first understanding of a higher power was a guy I really liked, a friend of mine now, who had his stuff together, good father, good job, dressed well, the sort of things that impressed me back then. He said to me, just, do you believe that I believe, Matt? And I looked at him, he was like five years at the time, and just looked a world away from where I was, and I just was that desperate, willing to go to any length to get it this time. And I just started off with that. I said, yeah, I believe it, if you believe it. I believe it. And then when I got, you know, the sponsor and started going through the work and going through the steps, started to be my home group, people that I could share my innermost with and the power generated in the rooms or in the meeting. Um, and then it became the universe for a little bit. Mother Nature. I used to love... I used to start noticing it. Again, it says it in the literature, you know. You, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. I don't know it off by heart, but it talks about you were unable to see the the the, the beautiful trees because you were always distracted by the vulgar ones, something along that those lines. And I started to see things differently. I started to see the tree line of an autumn an autumn Sunday the leaves turning and the moon at night and the sun and looked at the sea as a power greater than me. Um, and that really, uh, that really, it really held me for a little bit. But it's been a journey and I've constantly been seeking. And now I've come to a conclusion for me, which is, you know, it's God. God, the creator of all. And I work on that relationship on a daily basis. I heard a guy, Father Bill W, not the Bill W, it's a guy who does two-way prayer and he was a priest and he said, um, I wasted 20 years on step two. He said, I wasted 20 years. He said, someone put it over to me and they said to me, um, is there a possibility there could be a God? And he turned around to them and he said, yeah, possible, possible. Okay. So is it possible that that God could do for you what you couldn't do for yourself? Is that possible? And he said, yeah, that's possible. And he said, that's all I needed. He said, no, I was a priest. I was a vicar. And that just blew me away. And that's, you know, one, just, you know, someone sharing their experience. And the biggest enemy I have is me in my head. You know, that's why, you know, step three, when, when I made a decision, I don't I don't need to make that decision every day. I made it. I need to make a decision every day. For the first three years of my recovery, I was saying the same as step three prayer every day. But I don't need to keep making that decision. I've made it to turn my will, my thinking, and my life actions over to the care of God. Not to God, not over to God. God doesn't want all my stuff. Over to the care of God. The care of God. Really important to know that. And I understand him. So there's a lot of things I have to turn over to God. A lot of things in life. Um, I got diagnosed with cancer about a year into recovery. I had a, a loss to me bag for a year and my, miss, my, my partner was pregnant and um, it was a really difficult time and still is, still suffer today. Um, and I'm not sharing that out of, you know, look what's happened to me. I'm sharing that as an experience because um, that's one of the great things about AA. If your partner's left you for somebody else or your job, you know, it feels like it's the end of your world. You've lost that lovely job that you've had or the partner that you love has left you for another person or you get diagnosed with terminal illness. That's one of the amazing things because there's no one in these rooms that hasn't been through any life event stayed sober. No one. 
someone somewhere has been through losing a mother, losing a brother, losing a father, and got through it and stay sober. That's why meetings and connecting at meetings are really important, building your your lifeboat out of, you know, lifeboat of people that you can trust, not, not people that you that will give you the answers that you want. People that are willing to say to you, actually, Matt, you're falling short here, mate. I love you, but you're way off. I need that delivered to me with love and kindness, not with arrogance. Delivered, delivered you know, to me properly. I need to be pulled up sometimes. And I didn't find step four particularly. I hear this a lot, actually, you know. Um, it was the most amazing experience because I got rid of all this stuff. I didn't really find it like that. I kind of, kind of just did it because I was told to do it and I kind of wanted to get it out anyway. But Leon, my first sponsor, said, uh, my second sponsor said to me, he said, Matt, you'll have your spiritual awakening between steps five and 12. And he was right. He was absolutely right. So I kind of didn't want to be one of these people that got stuck on step four for a year. He said to me, Matt, did you drink slowly? I said, no, I didn't. He said to me, well then, get through this quickly. Get it done. You've got two weeks. And I did it. I did it in two weeks. Um, to the best of my belief, 20 minutes a day, bite-sized chunks. And I shared it with him. I shared it with him. There's that bit, isn't it, where it says, you know, if we don't share it with another, we may not overcome and we may drink again. I didn't want to be one of those people. I really didn't. So I just did it because I was willing to go to any lengths. And what I've realised, um, what I've really realised in, in recovery and in my journey is there's two... It was put to me like this, there's, there's two worlds. There's the material world that we live in, that I live in. You know, we always wanted a bigger house, a better car, more money, nicer holidays, that strife, that striving nonstop to, to get to the next place. You know, that's how I was. I'm not like that today. Um, and there's the spiritual world. There's the spiritual world where that God of my understanding who I feel so comforted by today. I feel like it's got my back. Whatever happens, it's got my back. Um, trying to live each day is the best human being I can possibly be. And don't get me wrong, I don't get it right all the time. You know that saying, you know, yeah, it's, um, it's progress, not perfection. It's progress, it's not perfection. I love that saying because it meant that I could pull out my get out of jail card and just act like a tosser for a little bit. And oh, it's progress, not perfection. Until it was said to me and explained to me, actually, Matt. Shoot for perfection, settle for progress. Total different mindset. Totally different. I'm never going to perfect it. I'm not sane. I know that. But if I shoot for it, if I shoot for it on a daily basis, trying to be the best person I can be for others around me, I spend less time thinking about me. Which is great. Because it's funny, it's like, you know, I share this, I, you know, I don't hold any secrets. It's like, when I get asked to do a chair, my first thought is, nah, can't be bothered. Nah. It's 10 o'clock here in Germany, where it's later than that now. It's 10 or 11. I like going to bed by about 10 now. But my first thought is, oh, I don't want to do it. What can't 
comes out of my mouth is, yeah, of course, no problem. But my default setting, my default setting is so selfish and self-centered because I never thought twice about drinking for three days in a row. But my head will tell me 10 o'clock is too late to talk about your experience to help another. That's what my head says. And it's a great reminder of why I need to be in it. I need to be in the middle of that triangle every single day. I need to go to meetings. I need to apply the principles to 12 steps and I need to help others. I have to be, I have to be in that because I start getting sick if I'm not. Start getting sick. I think I found one of the most amazing things when I, um, how long have I been talking for? I think I've been talking about 35 minutes. Just give us a shout when it's time. Um, was when I started looking at my defects of character. I started to really get into all the stuff. I uh, started to see the person I was. Because step four is just looking at all the stuff that's blocked me from God. And all my defects of character come out of my step four and all my amends come out of my step four. My amends list and my, my direct, who comes out of step four? And I heard lots of things being said about step six and seven. And again, one of the other things are, you know, these are God's steps. God, 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 will, God will remove these, short, these shortcomings. And, um, yeah, he will remove them when he's ready. Yeah, yeah, I get that. I get that. Defects of character and shortcomings. But that's a great get jail card for me. Because if I just think God will take it away from me at some point, and I just behave exactly the way that I've been, behave, that I, I behave without drinking, I'm not really having a spiritual awakening. I ain't changing, just not drinking. I'm selfish, I'm self-centered to the core, but I ain't changing. Joe and Charlie put it across in the best way. They said, um, if you look at the 12 steps as ingredients of a cake, you use all 12, you get the best looking, you've got best tasting cake. If you use six or seven of them, you'll still get a cake, but it won't taste or look as good. And that just sums it all up for me. Totally get that. So the the defects to character and the, and the shortcomings are, well, shortcomings and, and defects are the same thing, exactly the same. No difference between the two. So I had a concise list of what my defects of character were. And I took action on my behalf to try and change you need to try and change because the head that got me here with the behavior and this, you know, all the things I did can't be the same head that gets me out of it. I need to enlist in a power greater than myself to help and guide me. That's what I need. And I need to remain in constant contact with that power because I need that power's help because I can't do it on my own. So if we look at one of my my missus still says to me, I'm hugely impatient today. So if my defect character is being impatient, what God is going to do, he's going to stick a driver in front of me driving 20 miles an hour at a 50 for about six miles. That's what he's going to do. He's going to put those situations in my life for me to put the action in and start changing the way that I act. Start changing the way that I do things. When I'm in that supermarket queue and it's 10 people deep and all I've got is a can of Diet Coke. Patience. You know, when my four-year-old has literally just got me to the point where I just want to go nuts. I have to have that power of pause. I need God, which is the power of pause, to come to that T-junction of, right, am I going to rip Maximilian's head off here? Or am I going to go a different route? And I feel it. I 
feel that power. I can't, I can't think my way into my action. I can't do it. Tried it. I have to act my way into right thinking. Have to. Have to, have to, have to. So we didn't get to that point of, I suppose, gone out, you know, how did I feel about making direct amends to people? You know what? One of the reasons why I think contributed to me not getting this program straight away is when I went out to make amends to people first off, it was self-centered. It was, this is how my amends went, right? My amends went, here's my ex-wife, for example. Gemma, I'm sorry for the things I did. I really am. Um, I really am sorry, but guess what? I just got out of treatment and I've lost everything and I stopped talking about me. So the amends wasn't genuine. It was still about me. And when I made amends third time round for people, it was different. I felt it in my heart, language of the heart. You know, I'm sorry for what I did. How did it make you feel? Is there anything I can do to try and make it right? Anything. That, that was coming from my heart. Whereas first time around, it was coming from a position of ego. Look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. Different, totally different. And then I suppose when I, when I look at the last three steps on a daily basis, 10, 11, and 12, which are the steps that if I'm really hard pushed, I'll say I'll work. But it's just like brushing my teeth for me now in the morning. There's that great bit in the book on awakening reading, God divorced me from self-pity, self-seeking, dishonest motives. You know, pause, think about your day. Where could I possibly trip up today? What have I got to do? Oh, I've got to go to see my mother-in-law and my father-in-law. I really don't want to go. That's something where, you know, I need to, I need God to help me with that power to get me through those situations sometimes. I need that. You know, that step 10, that daily walking around step, like a drone over my head, watching me, watching my behavior, watching me, you know, what's building up. Am I in fear? Am I in resentment? Um, am I about to be dishonest? Okay, right, I'm resentful. God, please divorce me from this resentfulness. God, if I've harmed somebody, tell God, talk to another. Daily inventory, watching myself, watching myself, watching myself. And the great thing about step 11 is like when you, when you come to review your day, when you come to review your day, um, I can think, oh, I've had a bloody good day today. I don't think I was fearful. I wasn't resentful. I wasn't disheartened. I think I've been all right. And don't get me wrong, I don't write a whole chapter about what my day was like. But I do go through it in my head. And it is amazing what comes up that I've missed. I think to myself, how did I miss that? How did I miss that? And then when I look at it and I look where I've fallen short, I then ask God to forgive me. And I then ask God to help me do better tomorrow. Wake up, step 11, awakening. And the key thing for me, and I'll, I'll finish on this, it's about 45 minutes now. Um, again, another line from the big book, which really, it's been my experience. I remember saying to my, I was about a year so ago, I said to my sponsor, you know what? Not happy. He was like, oh, what's wrong? I was like, I do loads of meetings, um, I pray, I meditate, I do gratitude lists, do everything. Everything you tell me to do, I do. And it's on me. It's on me. I think my missus was away one weekend. And, and he turned around to me and he said to me, Matt, when was the last time you got somebody's number, somebody new, someone fresher in? that you've remained in contact with or you're given a call on a daily basis to see how they are. And I have done that for a long time. And he brought me to the bit in the book where it says, when all other measures fail, all other measures, 
there's nothing like working with a still suffering. That's why I put myself out to sponsor people that really like the term sponsor. All I'm doing is taking someone through the work as I was taken through it, laying out the tools for their inspection. It's down to them if they want to do it or not. Sponsorship comes from love, not control. I don't say to people, you need to call me every day at nine o'clock and if you call me at five past nine, I ain't answering. That's bullshit. It's not, that's not what it is about for me. It comes from a place of love, not ego. I can't, I'm powerless over people. That's saying, powerless over people, places and things. People, places and things. Rubbish. Rubbish. I'm not powerless over places. I'm not powerless over some things. What I am powerless over is people. I am completely powerless over people. So, uh, just to finish up, what can I say? So, I am five years, three months, two months, five years, two months over. I have a beautiful little boy, Maximilian. He's turning four on August the 18th. He's never seen me drink and use. I have a beautiful partner who loves me for being me I don't need to pretend to be somebody else I don't have any financial debt today I've managed to pay all of my debt off in recovery I don't hate the person that I look at in the mirror in the morning anymore I have respect for that person I'm a good upstanding member of my community I mean look I've, I've shared this with you I've even put my hand up to help the local football team and I don't speak any German. So, you know, I'm, I'm teaching young kids how to play football. That isn't my first thought that I want to do stuff like that. But I'm doing it. I didn't share this. I was a professional footballer for 12 years. And um, so that's why I've done it. What can I give back to people? What can I do to take the emphasis away from me? Because service isn't just about making teas and coffees in meetings. Service is what I can do everywhere. And the best thing I heard, and I'll leave it on this, right, is um, if you want to know how good my recovery is, don't ask me, because I can tell you it's great. Ask my missus, my mum, my brother, and my family. They'll tell you how good my recovery is. Simple as that. And with that, it's 45 minutes. Um, I hope I've given someone a little bit of hope tonight. And, uh, yeah, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And thank you for... For the, for the opportunity to do service. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.